So thank you for the invitation. In uh, this talk, I will explain to you a new idea to quantize particles with a new prescription, which leads to the notion of fake, huh? of fake particle. And that leads to what I claim to be the right solution for the problem of quantum gravity. Then we will see the physical implications. Some of them are important predictions, and uh, we will start moving forward to study the classical limit in an, an even a concrete example with the Friedman Robinson Walker solution, and some hints towards implications in cosmology. Now, what's the problem? The problem of quantum gravity is to make it renormalizable and unitary at the same time. And uh, if you use higher derivatives, you improve the ultraviolet behavior of propagators, but you generate a problem with unitarity. The improvement can solve the problem of renormalizability, but then you have ghosts, at least you have ghosts if you quantize things in the usual way, which is the Feynman prescription. But we will see that there is an alternative way. But that is the problem, to make the theory renormalizable and unitary at the same time. So let's discuss unitarity. Unitarity is a statement that the S matrix is unitary. And if you write S as 1 plus IT, you can write the same identity, this form, in this form, which is known as optical theory. When you take states from your Fox space, you get this kind of identity with no, forget about this for the moment. Okay, this is the identity. But the point is that when you want to use higher derivatives, because of this minus sign, you do not prove unitarity. You can prove what's known as a pseudo-unitarity equation, which has a very similar form, but instead of having a completeness relation here, have a modified relation where some states of your Fox space are multiplied by minus one. And those are unphysical states. That is a violation of unitarity. So that's the problem. There is a diagrammatic version of this identity which can be studied perturbatively. These are known as cutting equations and cut diagrams. And uh, basically, you have that the imaginary part of an amplitude is positive. That's a strong constraint, if unitarity holds. Otherwise, you have violations. And a good and interesting property of this identity here, or here, is that it is quadratic. It's not linear. This is linear. This is quadratic. And that means that it mixes different orders of the perturbative expansion. It means that if you change something at the tree level, it will be reverberating at one loop, and so on and so forth. So, for example, these are the simplest cutting equations. This is a tree diagram, and it can be expressed as a cross-section. Tree, tree. But this is tree, and this is one loop. So you have the imaginary part of the bubble diagram is a cut diagram. It's a very similar cross section with the same vertex rotated. And this gives constraints on uh, your propagator, for example, here. So let's discuss the first identity. Take your propagator, 1 divided by p squared minus m squared. That's ill-defined. You need a prescription. The, pres the Feynman prescription tells you to modify it like that. That is good. Because if you insert it here, you will check that the optical theorem holds. If you take the imaginary part of this with that prescription, you will get plus pi delta p squared minus m squared. And you can check that this also comes from the calculation of that cross-section with integral over the finite over the finite states phase space. Now, what is a ghost? Something that we meet in higher derivatives 
because of that minus sign. A ghost is the same propagator with a minus sign in front. Of course, if you multiply that by a minus sign here, on the right hand side, nothing changes, because there is no propagator there, there's only a vertex, and so you violate the optical theorem, you violate finitite. But you could change both signs, one here and one here. If you change the prescription, you do not violate unitarity. So if you change the prescription, you have a minus sign in front, which cancels another minus sign that was there. And a minus sign here, and the optical theorem is OK. However, these two propagators cannot coexist in general in uh, quantum field theory. Why? Uh, they are used both, but not in the same Feynman diagram. One is a propagator for S, the other is a propagator for S dagger. So they, are, they appear both in these cutting equations, but on opposite sides of these cuts, for those who know what I'm talking about. They do not appear in the same Feynman diagram because, as I showed um, some years ago with a Yeti, a physicist from Rome, you get so bad divergences that you have to throw away your entire theory, particularly if you define it in Minkowski space time, actually, as you should do, or you would naively do. And uh, basically, from a local theory, you generate non local divergences. So you violate lo the locality of counterpoints. So there is a reason why people have not studied those propagated propagators together. There is one way to make them coexist. There is only one way. Now we see the way, which leads to this notion. Let's again start from this propagator, which has two poles on the real axis, and you need a prescription. The Feynman prescription tells you to integrate like that, which means that you leave the left pole above the integration path and the right pole below the integration path. Now do the following thing. Put a plus or minus sign in front just to show you that whatever I'm telling you now will hold for both signs. We, show, uh, we saw that we could not change the sign in front of a Feynman propagator, but we will be able to do this for both signs. Multiply and divide by p squared minus m squared. Ignore the numerator, for example, for a moment. And uh, that means to split the poles into pairs of poles. And if you do not uh, touch the integration path, you will end up with this integration path, which I call Liebig integration path, because it appeared in the Liebig models. Now, Liebig models have been surrounded by skepticism for a long time. There is a reason for that, because Lee and Vick got this right, but they missed another part that we will see in a moment, which is necessary to make everything work. So we want this kind of splitting, and uh, the idea is at this point that you add a width in the denominator, which is like the epsilon of a Feynman propagator, but is a new, it will have to tend to zero. So you have this kind of propagator in the end, which is a combination of the two propagators that we saw could exist, could not coexist. Now we will see how to make them coexist. Um, you see, the residue of this propagator is zero on shell. So basically it suggests that there is no particle propagating here. It's not a plus i epsilon, it's this kind of thing. And uh, uh, what about the bad divergences? The bad divergences will not be around because we will not integrate in Minkowski spacetime. It is not equivalent to integrate on Euclidean. And the reason is that the Vick rotation is a non-analytic operation. We will see that this is the key to everything. But it is a well-defined non-analytic and unambiguous non-analytic operation. So now we move to the optical theorem for the other basic uh, 
um, example that we were discussing, and that, that is this one. We will start the bubble diagram, which is a very basic example to start with. We will take a bubble diagram with these kind, kinds of propagators. So they look complicated, but these are rational functions. They are not really much more complicated than usual. One thing we have learned that we will integrate the loop energy K0 on the Liebig integration path. You do that with the residue theorem. Okay, that will select the right poles for the residues. Those two, one pair or the other pair, basically, not these two. That's what leads to the bad divergences in Minkowski spacetime. After you integrate on uh, the Liebig integration path, you get something like this. A certain integral here, which can be written, it's not very complicated, and the result will be an analytic function anytime the integral is uh, non singular. Any time for some energy, external momentum P, any time the integral is non-singular for every loop space momentum spanning R3, if and only if it is non-singular for every loop space momentum, then you get an analytic function in P. So it's important to study the singularity of this integrand. Singularity occurs when a process takes place, so energy equals sum of frequencies. It's the usual condition, with the difference that now you have complex masses. But if there were not no complex masses here, this would be, would be just the usual location of the singularity. And the usual location of the singularity gives two branch cuts. Okay? The Feynman prescription tells you that you have to circumvent the branch cut from above, here, from below, here, and the complex conjugate prescription, which goes into S dagger, is the other way around. But now you have complex masses, and when you plot this thing for K spanning the entire R3, the solution fills these two regions, extended regions. If they are filled. Every point inside is singular. And inside you violate analyticity because of the singularity, and you also violate Lorentz invariance. So this was where the Liebig models were. And we took them, well, they have been already reinterpreted to, to ease out the next part. You can understand that you violate Lorentz invariance because if you integrate on this funny integration path for the loop energy, you cannot take real values for the loop space momentum you will have to touch this thing. And this is the crucial thing. You will have to look for a deformation of the integration domain on the momentum loop momentum space into a new integration domain, if it exists. Well, it turns out that it, it exists. And uh, there is a unique deformation that takes the entire region down to the branch cut you would like. Everything good? No. Nothing is solved because you still have to tell me how to compute amplitudes. And if you come from the Euclidean, the Euclidean is here, by an analytic, uh, by an analytic rotation, the Vick rotation, you will come from above. And this is again the Feynman prescription, and that will lead to ghosts. But this construction tells you that you can do one new thing. Since this region was extended, what you do is as follows, the following thing. If you want to compute our amplitude in this part of the real axis, you go inside the region, calculate everything there with the wrong integration domain. It will be non-analytic and non-Lorentz invariance. Then you view the result as a function of the integration domain. You deform the integration domain of the loop space momentum. You shrink the region and then you recover Lorentz invariance and analyticity. And this is the answer. Basically, you are computing on branch cuts inside. And then, uh, instead of doing what Feynman would do, and then if you want, you can take your result, which will be an analytic function, 
and by analyticity you can extend it to an enlarged region, a cone, just to be explicit here. And what you will discover is that your complex plane is divided into regions of analyticity. And the Euclidean region and this region are separated. So you have two uh, portions of uh, three, because there is a symmetric one, of the complex plane where you have analyticity. But from here, from the Euclidean region to there, you cannot go in an analytic way. But you can go in a very simple non-analytic way. It's a theorem that you can prove. The entire construction I told you, which is very difficult to implement from the computational point of view, has a very simple solution, because the result that you find inside is equal to the average of the two analytic continuations from above and from below. It's a non-analytic operation, but it is non-ambiguous because it is just the average of two analytic conjugations. What is good for uh, unitarity? The entire construction is symmetric with respect to the real axis. And that means that the imaginary part is zero of the amplitude. Here, because it's the usual, and there, because of the new uh, prescription. So basically, if you compute the imaginary part of uh, the bubble where you have phacons, these kind of things will be called phacons from now on, in between uh, virtual phacons, that's zero. And uh, you should have, for unitarity, that equal to some cross-section. But remember, in the optical theorem, the cross-section should be a sum. Uh, there was also a sum over, over the final states and then the integral of the phase space. How to have this zero? You just state that these things do not belong to the physical space. So that is the projection. You have to. Otherwise, if you keep them in the physical space, you would have zero equal to something that cannot be zero. Normally, you cannot project things away like that. Because if you say that something does not belong to the physical space, you kill, for example, this thing. But the imaginary part will continue to be non-zero with the usual prescription. That's why having a quadratic uh, equation is very constraining. You cannot change the tree level by projecting away something because it will be regenerated at one loop. It is not regenerated here because you have changed the prescription. So when you project, prescribe in the new way and project, you will have that the wrong identity collapses into the right one once you restrict your final states, initial states, to the proper subspace. So the key is, normally you cannot restrict, you can always restrict A and B. You cannot restrict what happens in between, because that's a completeness relation. Here you can. So basically, instead of having at one loop, for example, this kind of amplitude, which is analytic apart from two branch cuts, you have this. It's a little bit uh, short. It's more complicated. There are some integrals on the final parameters, but basically it's like that. And this splits the complex plane into two regions, and we will see the uh, physical consequences of this in a moment. So to all others, this can be proved. But here I just stick to the bubble. Let's see what you can do with quantum gravity. You can consider, for example, this higher derivative theory, which is the simplest you can uh, consider. Cosmological term R, phi squared, R squared. If you want, you can couple it to the standard model covariantized. Another way is to eliminate the ex uh, higher derivative uh, theories by extra fields, and then you will have a triplet described by the metric, a spin 2, massive spin 2, and a massive scalar. The metric has the Hilbert action, zero cosmological constant here for, for simplicity. The scalar field has a very normal action, 
these parameters xi, alpha, and zeta are all positive, so this is positive, fine. The spin 2 has a complicated action, but uh, you can uh, work it out more explicitly. You will find a Pauli fields, covariantized Pauli fields, plus non minimal couplings. But the important thing is that the covariantized Pauli fields has a minus sign in front. That field has to be quantized as a phaeton and projected away. In this way, you have renormalizability and unitarity. I can show you that renormalizability is um, not affected. Well, that's simple, by the way, because um, nothing really changes in the Euclidean region. So once you renormalize the theory in the Euclidean region, nothing really changes in the Euclidean region. But since every other region is a, an average of continuations from the Euclidean regions, when you have renormalized the Euclidean region, you have renormalized everything. Because the continuation of something convergent is convergent, of course. So the, there is a triplet, um, and one thing, at least one, I mean, is a quantized, is to be quantized like this. Instead, phi should be, phi can be quantized both ways because its coefficient is correct. And uh, with a plus, you can use the Feynman prescription. And with a plus or minus, you can use the fake prescription. So is phi uh, a fake or not? Who knows? That will be decided by nature. Let's see how to describe the projection in, uh, uh, at the level um, of a functional integral. That's very simple. It's a very simple operation, um, conceptually. Then to implement it, we will have some new things that we will describe. But basically, take a gamma functional with physical fields and phacons. To project the phacons away, you just solve their equations and you insert the solution back into gamma. It's quicker to see it at the level of the partition function. You just do not insert any source for the fake field. Basically, you are integrating the fake field out. Basically, the fake field is an auxiliary field with a kinetic term. And when you integrate it out, conceptually simple, but you have to use the prescription that I described before. So in every Feynman diagram, you will have to do all those kinds of operations. At the tree level, it's simpler. So let's move to the classical limit where we can see what happens more concretely and even uh, some physical prediction. Let's see the classical limit. So we started from a classical action. The classical action, which could be written in two ways, higher derivatives or, or no higher derivatives with more fields. But that is not the classical limit. Normally in quantum field theory, the classical action that we start with is a classical limit. Here it is not because it's unprojected. It contains something more. So we can see how this projection works at a classical level because there it is kind of simple. So you have a, an unprojected classical theory, and then you will have a projected classical theory. First, you have to start from this action, which I call interim classical action. You quantize it with this prescription, and then you take the classical limit. So the correct classical theory turns out to be the classicization of the quantum field theory. But you can also consider the unprojected field equations for g mu nu phi and chi. How do the projective field equation look like? Basically, you have to solve the equation for the fake and insert the solutions in the other two. You do not have initial conditions. You cannot choose initial conditions for chi because the solution of its own field equations is completely blocked by the prescription. So you, you have a Cauchy problem, basically, with the initial conditions only for the physical particles. That's how the projection works. At the tree level, some subtleties uh, about the integration paths, integration domains are not important because there are no loop integrals. So basically, you can take that propagator as its standard. 
and you have a principal value. Okay, let's see some simple example in uh, non-relativistic uh, mechanics to see what happens. Um, so you have mv squared divided by 2 plus an external force, xf, and we add higher derivatives. We want to study this theory following this kind of thing, uh, it's a, this kind of approach. There will be extra degrees of freedom because your field equation is not ma equal external force, but you have this extra um, operator multiplying. What you do is to invert it with the, the classical limit of the Facon prescription, which is the principal value of that. And you get this kind of equation. So instead of having f equal ma, you have ma equals to some average of f. And that average is an oscillating function, very strongly oscillating function, which tells you that you have to know a little bit of future, basically, to predict the future. And that is a violation of microcausality. So basically, this tells you that in the end, you have a theory that is renormalizable, that is unitary. Analyticity is generalizing to region-wise analyticity, which is related to this um, um, change in the nature of space-time. This quantum gravity should lead to, to a change in our understanding of space-time as very small distances. Here, it is not assumed. It is, comes from the theory. And uh, since the masses governing this tau is the mass of the phaeton, could be 10 to the 12 GeV from 10 to the 19 GeV, these are very, very short times. Uh, 10 to the minus 36 seconds or shortly. So that means that below that time, you cannot talk about time. There is no past, present, future, there is no cause, there is no effect. And this is such a strongly oscillating function that we cannot appreciate it as its effect. Actually, now with a couple of students, we are really trying to understand how, in some cosmological uh, situations, maybe there could be a way to, to detect even this kind of effect, but it's very small. So to move forward towards more um, explicit applications, let's study, for example, these problems in the friedman robertson walker matrix, this kind of matrix. Now, in the friedman robertson walker case, the vile squared term is not important, so let me kill it, the chi is not important. And uh, we, uh, I told you that there was a, an option to, to consider phi as a phacon or not. Let me assume that it is a phacon itself, because if it's not, then in the Friedman Robertson Walker case, I do not have any projection that will be physical, like the ground. But one possibility is that phi is fake. By the way, in, in other possibilities, many particles that we have seen are think we have seen could be fake. We will come to that at the very end. Anyway, the Lagrangian is just this. And if you write down the unprojected field equations, by the way, something that I didn't find noticed in the theory is that they factorize in a nice way, very nice way. So uh, the right-hand sides have a, a factorization, factorized structure with these two proper uh, operators, which makes the uh, projection a little bit easier, because then you just take those uh, and invert them with the um, Facon prescription, and that gives the projected equations. Easy to write, not so easy to, to use and understand, but typically they will be similar to the Friedman equations with sources, um, I mean the pressure and the external the, the, the energy that, that are averaged in some way. Now, um, this projection can be handled exactly in some simple cases and uh, uh, they can be solved explicitly even with this kind of average, which are radiation 
uh, the vacuum energy, and even the combination of the two, basically the combination of the two is the situation with this kind of state equation. The pressure is rho divided by 3 plus a constant. So this is radiation. P equal P0 is a constant, is the vacuum energy. The case of dust uh, cannot be solved exactly. And uh, then you run into some new uh, features. Before the conclusions, I describe those features. Because I cannot go into details, but it's interesting to know uh, something new, very new, is going to happen here. We have defined this uh, um, uh, projection, and we have built the theory of we have studied the classical limit, classicize, and the quantum theory. The point is, the quantum theory is defined perturbatively. It is defined perturbatively. So, um, the entire classical theory that you find after the projection, and the projection itself is defined perturbatively. There are cases where you need to know more than pertur the perturbative expansion. And... Uh, when you need more than the probability so even in the classical, I'm, to, I'm telling you that the classical theory, the classical limit, will exhibit many, many of the features of the quantum theory comes from. Asymptotic series, a need of including non-perturbative effects, which could be important when, at the very beginning of the Big Bang, for example. Conclusions. So quantum field theory of particles and phacons offers new opportunities for high energy physics and quantum gravity because the phacons allow us to quantize gravity um, in a renormalizable and unitary way. The new understanding of space-time is related to the violation of causality at energies last, larger than the phacon masses, a thing that opens many new investigations. Phacons do not belong to the space of physical spaces, so they are not asymptotic space, uh, states, they are just virtual. So it's a quantum that can only be virtual. A quantum that can be virtual but not physical, not uh, asymptotic, leads to a violation of causality and a new notion of analyticity. What about the, the, the bosons that we think we have already seen? Are they fake or physical? Well, I have analyzed all of them. The many bosons have never have never been seen. The Higgs has already been, has always been virtual. You cannot see Ws, you cannot see Z, uh, the Z0 boson. You can only see them uh, from indirectly from the decay products. Well, since these uh, this prescription affects the imaginary parts at one loop above certain thresholds, there is a correction assuming that they are fake, but I claim that in the case of the Higgs field, only in the case of the Higgs field, the correction is not, has not been observed. Um, it's uh, beyond the, the possibilities of experiments that have already been done. So it's still open. The Higgs field could be fake. The classical action is just an interim local action. It's local, but it's an interim one. It's not the classical limit. And the classicization, as well as entire construction, is perturbative because it comes from uh, perturbative quantum field theory. I do not know today what the non-perturbative prescription, the non-perturbative projection, will look like. And so you may run into asymptotic series in some cases as simple, for example, as dust, P equals zero leads to very, very complicated things. Um, since some people ask me, just to conclude the comment on the other approaches of quantum to quantum gravity, why I think that mine is the right one answer. Uh, some referees complained that I didn't insert comments about the other approaches, so I inserted comments with criticism, and they were happy. So, fine with that. String theory is non-predictive. There is little to say about that. Calculations are not uh, well defined and not completely understood because of mathematics with Riemann surfaces. Maybe on the torus, maybe you can do something simple. Loop quantum gravity is even more challenging because it's an earlier stage of development. Holography and asymptotic safety are non perturbative. And you know that in quantum field theory, what we handle well is perturbative framework. 
So my approach is the closest to the standard model. It's a quantum field theory first. It doesn't go far away. It admits a perturbative expansion in terms of Feynman diagrams. It's exactly as it, the standard model. The calculations can be done with a comparable effort. And so it is predictive. It's rigid, only two new parameters, the masses of phi and chi, you know. And actually, it could, be to, it could out, turn out to be the most predictive theory ever, because perturbatively, it can cover energies or distances from the astronomical distances down to the Planck scale, and even below the Planck scale. Thank you very much. This thing. Uh, I, I'm aware of attempts to um, to study microcausality. Let me comment that that is a very very delicate thing because there is no notion of causality in quantum field theory. So there are many people who think they can talk about causality. I claim they cannot. You can check uh, uh, Toft's diagram, Toft Weltman diagram. If you are aware of this booklet, it's very very simple. They make a discussion on causality and they make a comment that they will explain why in quantum field theory we do not have a definition of causality. Um, you can take Bogolyubov causality, for example. That's an off-shell formulation. It is not a condition on the S-matrix. There is no experimental definition of causality in quantum field theory. That's a very, very tricky thing. But to answer your question, we could already know the answer, but we, did, we don't. This is the observation of the Z peak at LEP 2. And this is the Z bosons. There are many corrections to the Z which come from loops. One is this. But this has a threshold which is the mass of Z plus the mass of H. That's 216 GV. In my prescription, this changes, but lab 2 stops, stopped as 210 GB. We would already know the answer. Uh, you, you said that the calculability was one of the features of this uh, presentation. Now, this means you can compute, for example, graviton, graviton scattering and quantum. And you have the result? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, um, let's see. I don't have it in these transparencies. Um, yeah, I can give you the, the result if you want. So, by the way, it's related to the central charge known as C for, from conformity theory, yes. So let's say that the first issue was calculated. Um, then I assume that also in the unbroken phase, the field regarding to the exoskeleton, the hypothetical exoskeleton, and then with the manuscript to the regular, there might be some difficult parts that are the group Okay. Now that's a good question, actually. Um, we are in the broken phase, so that's where I can. Um, uh, ask this question because the FACOM would have a different prescription from the other degrees of freedom and that would translate in an unbroken phase which is would be much more complicated than one, what we think it is but I am a very um, practical person we have not seen the unbroken phase so that could happen would be the unbroken phase from the broken phase described by this would be non-perturbative in some sense. There is a singularity. 
but uh, from the strictly experimental point of view, this is possible. So uh, simplicity arguments are fine most of the times, sometimes. So, so the unbroken phase would be trickier than what we expect. Because um, you are, uh, each has four degrees of freedom, three are quantized one way, one is quantized a different way. In the broken phase, everything is fine. In the unbroken phase, you will have some uh, new non perturbative effect. Is there a, a additional thing in your theory that you can tell which particles are fake ones or normal, or it's completely your freedom that basically you decide later or, or yeah, no. you observe, but is there some hint in the theory that normalizes you get a priori say this could be fake or this could be normal? There are some constraints. All phacons can only be massive. The masses has to be large because if they are massless, you violate causality everywhere, which is contrary to experiment. But only constraints come from experiment. And uh, basically, you can construct a theory of quantum field theory, standard model, whatever, of particles and phacons now. And you can add as many phacons as you want. It's the same way as in the standard model. You can add as many massive particles as you wish. There is no restriction there, and there is no restriction here. It's not a drawback. Yeah. So, uh, in a perturbative fashion, uh, you have a general background. Uh, how does the prescription work? Do you just uh, identify the ghosts and turn off the... No, no, I simply do not know the answer to that. This is uh, what comes from the same approach as... Uh, Roberto was saying in normally quantum gravity and standard model of particle physics proceeded along different paths. I'm proceeding along the only path that was successful, which is perturbative theory, standard model, expansion around flat space. Okay, there are two questions. 